Um, welcome to our panel on public scholarship and applied research in graduate seminars. Um, we have with us um, um, Richard Mankis from um, UBC and uh, Lily Hart, uh, MA student, now incoming PhD student uh, from, P uh, from UBC. And we're going to talk about um, the course example history um, 595B, public history, um, for our course today. Um, my name is Annika Rosanowski. I work with the UBC Arts Amplifier. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. The UBC Arts Amplifier is a very small um, initiative um, in the Faculty of Arts that tries to connect graduate students to sort of meaningful um, forms of engagement, engaging their research um, outside of campus, basically, to sort of do applying their research with community organizations or industry partners off campus um, to sort of diversify their own career paths, but also to sort of understand and more strongly how their own research actually applies to um, real world problems um, that are being solved um, sort of outside of the ivory um, tower. And so um, I'm here sort of a little bit just to facilitate and I'm also going to share a little bit of resources in what forms we can help if any um, of you in the audience would be interested in pursuing some form of applied research in your own classes, um, then we can um, help you with that. So I'd like to uh, thank you all for gathering with me on the unceded ancestral and traditional territories. I'm today um, talking to you from what is also called um, Fairview um, or otherwise the territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And I was thinking about um, doing this land acknowledgement again as um, for example, somebody who's also not, not from Canada um, and a, an unwanted visitor in that sense here. And I thought I could pose the question sort of to all of you as sort of a takeaway to think about for today. In, in what way this knowledge, this, this acknowledgement um, informs anything that you do in your, in your everyday life? Does that um, inform the relationships that you form? Does that um, inform any of the decisions that you make while you're at work? What is sort of the importance for you um, of knowing that you are on these territories. So for today, we're going to talk about applied research projects. Um, I thought maybe, and we're also not too many people, maybe we can start with a brief question of if anybody in the audience has actually um, used an applied research project before. Um, if you like, you can use the raise hand function um, to let us know. Um, if any of you are familiar with the concept. Nobody, okay, that is perfect. So we can introduce you a little bit um, to um, what applied research projects are. We're keeping this very uh, broad um, overall. So for an applied research project, you indeed design your course with a project component that would mean students will work um, with an off-campus partner um, that could be um, oh, perfect, Dury. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Public facing website can be indeed absolutely form of like um, public research project. So the applied component is indeed coming in from if you have an off campus partner, that might be an arts organization that, for example, needs um, a new framework for the next grant application that they want to do. Or maybe it's a not-for-profit that wants to do um, an environment scan about um, the kinds of service gaps that they encounter. Um, it could be um, a service provider who likewise um, needs some insight from somebody with the necessary um, knowledge and skills um, to help them assess um, a certain situation. And so what your students would do in these kinds of um, projects um, is they would help the community partner actually um, solve these um, problems. And so in short, um, students actually get to experience how their knowledge, how their whole degree experience applies to things outside of university. And so helped by your own course and the framework that you provide through sort of the classroom learning and that community partner project you sort of get to help students um, transitioning um, that knowledge into a new context. And so we have um, two um, people here with us um, today who are going to talk a little bit about their particular experiences. 
because there's various good reasons why um, these um, applied research projects are really beneficial um, to incorporate. Um, a lot of it is, um, some, of, some of it is very obvious, um, like you allow students to, to grow um, their professional connections with people that are not just within a university context. Um, but you also provide skills where um, students learn how they can communicate their research in ways that is actually meaningful to people who don't work in academia. Likewise, um, because students have um, a new context, it often taps into a lot of creative potential in figuring out ways um, to address these new problems. Um, this exposure can also help with um, um, diversifying students' career paths, and it also helps um, with the intellectual confidence of knowing that that niche knowledge that was gathered in the core form of like a master's degree, for example, or even the PhD, um, can actually be applied on a broader scale and that, you know, there's something beyond that very specific niche research area that can actually be really useful and that students actually possess. Um, Likewise, um, a lot of um, research projects um, that are applied rely more on collaboration, either because the, of the community organization that actually um, has an input or because there's several students working on tackling this, program, this um, project together. Um, likewise, we have public communication and interpersonal skills, just again, because this is a lot of different people working together in a new context, and so that supports um, a lot of that. And so um, I'd now like you to welcome um, Professor Richard Menkes and uh, MA student Lily Hart, um, who are going to talk a little bit more about their experience. Um, um, yeah, would you two introduce yourselves briefly? Hi, I'm Richard Menkes. I teach in the Department of History. Um, my area is um, modern Jewish history. I also look at issues like uh, Canadian responses to the Third Reich. I have always been very interested in doing work with museums um, uh, and have created some exhibits, worked with others on exhibits. Um, and I'm uh, very excited to be here to talk to you about um, the most recent experience of doing that with students. Lily. Hi, I'm Lily Hart. Um, I'm a current MA, MA student, incoming PhD at the Department of History. Um, my current thesis has to do with the history of anthropology in Canada and my PhD work is more on like Pacific Northwest history and how small town historical societies constructed like stories of nationhood and settler colonialism and things like that. Um, and then I've done some public history. I did some public history in undergrad years um, and then now in grad school. And I'm also the uh, digital content manager at a nonprofit called Confluence. So I've done some stuff there as well. And, I'm excited to be here and thank you for asking me. Perfect. So I have a few questions that um, hopefully like provides all of you with a better idea of what um, Richard did um, in his course. Um, and so maybe Richard, you can just um, tell us sort of a bit more general about um, what the applied research component was in your history um, class and what community partner you um, collaborated on. Sure. Um... So this was a, a graduate course in public history, which means it's taking history beyond sort of the world of academic articles, you know, giving conference papers. In other words, beyond sort of the usual suspects when it comes to the academic modes of dissemination. Um, I didn't want this to be a theoretical investigation of public history, but really needed to be very much um, both theoretical and hands-on with practical applications. So the students were responsible for doing one public history project with another student and another on their own. And I decided to work with the Vancouver Holocaust Education Center because I've had experience working with them before, especially on a couple of exhibitions and education guides. And uh, very briefly, I can just, um, if I share my screen with you, so one of the assignments was a research guide, which students did um, uh, with, uh, in collaboration with one or two other students. Um, these research guides integrated into a structure which the Holocaust Center already had, um, where they introduced the materials for the center. So they had already done uh, one on what's called enemy aliens and war orphans. And then the students in the course did the research guides to 
diaries and correspondence, Holocaust photography, and issues relating to anti-Semitic propaganda. Students were also then responsible for an individual project. And this was something that kind of broke out of the mold of what the center had done because they had done before these sort of rather uh, tightly constructed and narrowly construed, I would say, um, uh, galleries. But what I wanted the students to do would be more a project individually where they created a narrative, whether it be in the form of a podcast or in the form of a, uh, a larger slideshow exhibition. And so that's what students did individually. They did one podcast, each student, well, three of the students did podcasts and four of the students did public history. And these were something, like I say, which is different than what um, the Holocaust Center has done before. And here we see Lily uh, with her podcast. And um, the others did, as I said, um, uh, exhibits. And there were four of them on the topics, um, topics that were, they were introduced to by working on the research guide as well. Uh, so that's it. I worked with the Vancouver Holocaust Education Center and we created um, instruments which they could be using and mounting on their uh, website. And that's my introductory blithering. Thank you so much. I think everybody get like um, a good idea of the kind of things that you can do. Um, Lily, I was wondering, was that component part of your reason why you took the class or did you not know in which case, like what was your reaction when you found out? Um, yeah, that was the reason I, yeah, definitely the reason I took it. So like, um, like I said, um, like I've done public history in undergrad um, and at Portland State University. I just wanted to continue to do it at a graduate level. Um, and so I, I signed up for it and I didn't you know, quite know all the details, but one thing I was really pleased about is we got to do our own uh, individual projects because in undergrad, all the classes I take in, um, it was like very much group work. So you might have like four people working together to write like one panel for like, um, like, a, like one label for a museum object or something, which is like a, useful thing but it was nice that we did like the group projects to kind of get um help each other like understand our topic you know the holocaust mine was holocaust photography and uh me and adina you know worked together on this um research guide and then we went off one of us did a gallery one of us did a podcast but like having that individual product at the end i think was really like it's a useful learning process which we can talk more about in the resume thing but like i was um yeah, i signed up with it for like particularly wanted to do a public history course, especially because the other course I was taking that term was uh, the MA writing seminar. So I was like, I want something that's used in a different part of the brain or, yeah. Here we go. Ah, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So in that case, I'm also curious, um, Bridget, why did you plan on um, applying? Like, why did, why did you want to incorporate the applied research project in your well, like I say, this is a course in public history and I really wanted it to be um, both a, uh, I didn't want it just to be theoretical, but I wanted it to be hands-on. Um, um, let me explain a little bit more about why it's so important for this kind of work to be done in general and why the hands-on component is important. Um, um, I thought that we could collectively, students and maybe we could collectively sort of explore what it is that historians can do, why they should do it, um, what historians have done in the past. And, and when we look at that, you can see that, you know, there's a long history of historians not just doing articles and books, but also being out there, being out there giving, um, being part of public policy. Um, in the past, it would have been, let's say, on radio or uh, television or working on movies, in addition to working on museum exhibitions. So um, I... I wanted students to understand that there are historians who lead, who work in other areas. And this is not just, I wanted them to have the opportunity to do it for themselves and to experience it. And it's, um, and it's not just sort of students or, or academics um, changing academic research and making it available for public, but rather it is a kind of dialogue 
and uh, share and learning about sharing authority, which I really wanted again the students to experience and not just to read about um, theoretically. So we want to see how it is that there are people out there who want to learn about history beyond the academy. And we also need to learn that there are stories that we should be listening to, which maybe traditionally we haven't listened to, and that we have to improve our, our listening skills. So um, I wanted students to have that experience, um, which I think will deepen them as historians, as civically minded, perhaps. Um, and then it's also, I think, really um, an important experience for learning to think critically even and clearly as historians. I mean, it's one thing for us to write 3000 word essays and think, okay, well, we've, you know, we've elaborated on the subject. It's when we do this kind of work, we can see how much more difficult it can be to write 300 words rather than 3000 words. And you only can do that um, if you sit down and, you know, and try to create an exhibit or in the case of an exhibit, how you blend together let's say visual with the written so that they complement each other. And, and definitely, I mean, we know photographs and illustration, photographs are not just an illustration, but often they're treated that way. But when you actually build an exhibit, you can see how the visual and the text are part of the need to be complementing each other narrative. Or in the case of, of the podcasts, how it is that you bring together your own narrative with the other voices so that they find a good balance. In other words, um, it's a way of learning as historians to communicate and to think more clearly. So I think um, it be, makes them, makes all of us into better historians as well as thinking about our responsibilities. Now, there's also, uh, I know this is the last point I'll make. There's also, of course, I feel like I'm gonna be giving specific details to a lot of the general remarks that you made at the beginning. And I'll try to color in, well, maybe I won't try to color always in the lines that you made, but I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit on them. Um, I want the students to see that professionally there are alternatives to being academic historians, to give them a chance to feel what it is to be in a museum or, um, or to, um, to try to do something for public broadcasting in, in the podcasts. So, to see that there are other things that historians can do, alternate career paths, or even if you do become an academic historian, that these are ways in which your profession has gone, which you can choose to do if you've, you know, if you've experienced it first. You can decide on the basis of your knowledge what it is that you want to do generally in terms of your career, and then more specifically, what practices you want to be involved with as a historian. So um, I'm gonna shut up now. Oh, you shared some really fantastic parts. I really, I think there's a really importance about the, the sharing of the authority and um, being included in the kinds of stories that can be told. But uh, I think you made a really good point too that um, there's a lot that can only be learned if you're actually engaged in the process rather than just looking at it sort of from the classroom. And so, um, Lily, was, was that an experience that, that you would recommend? Like, did it have some of that sort of desired impact for you? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I like, like thinking, like having to think through and think more clearly and things like that. Yeah, I think so. And I think that's like so true because I mean, like when we're writing our essays and stuff, we have to communicate to other academics or to our professors or, or things like that. And uh, it's one thing that can be difficult in itself, but like to really write clearly for the public is a whole different skill. Like you can take, you know, a long time to get those like 300 words done and I find too, like, um, like when I'm trying to like, like write my thesis or something, like thinking about how I would like tell this to a public audience, public member of the public, like really helps me think through like when my writing is just getting like convoluted and unclear. So like just that skill, even bringing that public writing skill into your own um, academic one can be really helpful. But yeah, I mean, I think personally, I always feel that, like, uh, there's like the research is great. To be, it's great to do research. It's great to do it internally, but like it has to be shared with the public or it's not, I mean, it just has to be like, otherwise, I don't know, there's not a huge point. So I think it's really um, 
important to be able to all of us to acquire that skill, even if we don't all go on to become like public historians or in the, the public sphere or whatever, just to be able to like go and do a lecture that the public can actually understand, you know, it's just because that suits for is kind of like a public, I don't know, I feel like our, we do have duties to like share what we research, right? Um, yeah, so I think it definitely like, I, I recommended it, uh, you know, and it came through for me in the class, I think. And then, um, you know, especially cause this is not like, um, like the Holocaust is not my area of study. So like having to kind of learn about it myself and then think about how to communicate it was like a really a learning process that was helpful for that. Nice. And so you've, you've talked a bit about like um, how like much you took away for like communication, how like how it's very different. Mm -hmm. um, is there other things in which that project made you think sort of um, change like your view of like of history or like did it or, or confirm any things that you sort of felt um, about history? Let's see, I mean, I think like one thing I found interesting was like, sort of like, um, you know, I know I've, I've done public history and not public history before. I don't think I realized like how, like when um, Dr. Mankies was talking about like radio, like I had never really thought about, of course, I think about podcasts now, but I never thought about how much um, history has been shared in the public sphere via radio and things like that for such a long time. Like there's Before there's like public history training, you know, in the 70s or 80s more, like there's still been, um, it's being, it's always being shared out. Um, and I think like that, changed a bit of it um like just thinking about the role of the public historian itself has been around for a long time um which actually would be helpful but my own phd but um let's see what else what change in history i think and then um and also just like i hadn't done a lot with i got si assigned to you know holocaust photography is like the area and i hadn't really done much with photography and thinking about that in any kind of historical context. So um, thinking about how to like, how photo photographs are interpreted and used. And we did some really, um, read some really useful articles on that. That also changed how I thought about their role, so. Thank you. Yeah, and do you, so I think there's a lot of good cases in which history is a particularly compelling example because you both talked about a lot of the artifacts that sort of mm -hmm. circulate in the public and, and a lot of engagement, but can you think of other classes um, that you've taken um, where you think like, or that you would like to take where you could see a similar applied research project being just sort of interesting or, or helping you in some way further understand the subject? Like a non-history non one? Um, Maybe, if you have one. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so, so I was like, wow, it's been, it's been so long. Um, yeah, so like, um, yes, yeah, so all the ones here, at UBC have taken our histories because of the grad program. I mean, I think a lot of classes could benefit from some sort of applied project, even though, like with this class, you know, it's the whole focus of public history, but like just thinking about like, say um, we do like in the history department, we do a um, MA thesis writing seminar, which I was taking at the same time as this, but I think it could be useful having like, even just like a week to think about it or like a mini project or think about how would you present your thesis research to the public and how could you do it? I think that could be useful for students um, because, um, I just, I mean, it'd be a useful thing to be able to do. Um, and then like the other classes, <laughs> how could you make an applied project for historiography? That'd be kind of funny, but I think it would be <laughs> interesting. Um, and then, you know, thinking, I'm trying to think back to like my pre MA days, like other subjects. Um, I think, you know, there's like, um, probably do a lot, I think a lot of humanities classes, you could have that be an option, at least for students, especially students, like maybe your final project is the essay or something else more applied. But um, of all the classes I've taken here, I think the other one, the best be at the MA research seminar, like just maybe you don't have time to actually do a project, but you have a week where you think of a concept or something. Yeah, um, I like that. I actually, I have a friend in physics who tried to really disseminate his thesis for an audience at the public library. And uh, he also said it was an amazing experience to sort of go from his PhD level yeah. to common knowledge physics and still trying to explain what it is that he was doing. And he also found it was a very good um, um, uh, 
practice. Yeah. Yeah. You have to step back away from like your little like blinded bubble of like PhD and then. Yeah, you. exactly. And so maybe, um, maybe Richard, you could tell us a little bit about if you think there are specific elements that we really, that would make a course particularly suitable for including um, such an applied research project. Like, was there something about your course that made it particularly easy or, or, or practical to include such a component? Well, I mean, it was, as I said before, it was, it was clearly something that was meant to, to explore the relationship between sort of, you know, what academics do sort of in the university and the ways in which they can present it outside the university and what they can learn by presenting it from outside the university. So it obviously had a, a direct sort of, um, and I, I just couldn't imagine doing a sort of a theoretical course on public history. It just didn't make sense to me. And that's also what my own experience was about. I think that every course to a certain extent can, as Lily was saying, can include an element or get people to think that, okay, well, you know, you know, there, and, and, you know, so much history now talks about representation. So instead, again, of just talking about representation sort of as, you know, this is what, you know, this is what's happened in museums, then, you know, in a course say, well, can you imagine an artifact that you would want to put into a museum or that you would want to describe for a museum or an image? So there could be always a very smallish practical component to it so that people can at least think that way or, or realize that if you're talking about representation, one of the ways you learn about it is that you try to do it yourself or you try to imagine doing it yourself in a in a kind of public setting. So I think that there's always a possibility of including it with, but in some courses it makes sense for there to be a much, you know, a much more elaborate and much more um, developed um, as a uh, developed um, uh, public research side. Um, uh, and, and this is one of them. Um, maybe you could share um, too for the audience how how much time of your class was spent for students on that um, applied research project. It was my view was that it was always going to have to be at least half of it was going to have to be on the on the on the on the public research project, um, and it was necessary to construct you know the you know to think in advance about the course to make sure that you've given it that amount of of time to make sure that it fits properly. Um, but yeah, I always, I always knew that there was always going to have to be um, a, a lion's share of the course is going to have to be about it. And if it's not about it, then it's going to be reflecting on having done it sort of in a more theoretical way. So it's always going to be looking at it. Um, but in terms of the hands-on, I knew there would always have to be, the, the strongest element would have to be the actual hands-on project. Um, and the question was, how do we build it in so that it fits into an academic course, but it, it also shows the students what's involved in doing it. Yeah, maybe following up on that, um, because you said like um, there's a little bit of ways in which you have to make it fit and sort of serve the purpose that you're thinking about. Are there any tips? Uh, that you would give an instructor who's never done an applied research project about what things they need to think about before they go about implementing one of them? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, you have to give yourself a lot of time, I think, to, um, to, to think it through, right? I mean, you've got to give yourself a lot of time uh, to find um, that balance between the practical and the theoretical. Um, and why do you need to have um, a lot of time? Because, and, and the way that you can deal with it is by um, consulting widely. Um, I, spoke, um, I spoke to all of my colleagues who had done public history and who had had a public component, listened to them. I was fortunate that I had some, I had some funding to help me get a student who like, did a lot of research in other syllabi to see what other places had done and then I could look. And so that took time. Then it also takes time to find the right partner because you know I may have certain skills or certain experiences, but I don't have, you know, like creating narratives for museums, but I don't have the, the skills that are the experience that those in museums would have to say to students, okay, well, you know, this is how you layer your text. This is how you include images, you know? And, and so you have to find the right partner so that they can get the experience 
um, in a way that is going to be most useful. And the Holocaust Center, I mean, I had experience working with them. And so I knew that, that there were the people there who could, um, who, could, um, who could help. But I also had to give myself time to think about, well, what institution do I want to work with? Like I looked at a variety and I spoke to, Ann, I, I spoke, uh, Leticia, I spoke to her about a variety of possibilities and then narrowed it down again to what I was familiar with because I needed to find a way of, of feeling comfortable with the projects that I was assigning and knowing the people that I was working with. Right. And so, um, but that didn't just mean that I, but it also meant that I, I, I sort of like, I knew the kinds of things that the Holocaust center did. And so I was the one by having looked at their website again and again and again, I was the one who said, well, this is what I think the practical projects can be. When did this be useful for you? So it takes a lot of time to, to sort of a kind of, um, you know, trial and error, asking a lot of people, um, but also digging deeply into the place that you're going to work to come up with the right project. So you got to give yourself a lot of time before the course starts. You got to think broadly and then narrow it down, um, figure out a way that you know that it'll be, um, don't make it, don't make it overly complicated for yourself because there's going to be, a, there inevitably may be complications you don't realize. So try to, you know, try to simplify it. So I worked with a, an agency that I knew and I had all the students work with one agency rather than putting them into other, you know, different ones, because then it would be another level of complication. So it requires a lot of time to organize and, um, and to, um, to consult widely, but then to narrow and, um, and then also to think about sort of just being good to yourself in terms of keeping it somewhat simple so that the students can benefit. And it won't be too hard for you. So that's give yourself lots of time and think widely, but then narrow it down. Do you um, anticipate um, doing the same project or like an extension of this project again for another history class? Um, I mean, I, I, uh, I, enjoy, I enjoyed this so much that I would like to do it again. Um, you know, the graduate, there are only a limited number of graduate courses that are offered every year. Um, and so, you know, it, it changes and you have to offer a variety of, of, um, of possibilities. But I mean, in my, in my undergraduate courses, in my, uh, in the capstone courses, um, I have also included, um, public history projects. And so, um, yeah, I will, I'll continue to do it. Sounds great. Um, Lily, maybe sort of going into um, um, sort of like your main your main takeaway, or maybe you want to talk a little bit about how how much interaction there was between you and the museum, for example, and and mm. how I don't know how it felt like having your podcast actually on the the website for the center, or yeah, what was sort of some of the really uh, amazing aspects of um, having done this project? Yeah, let's see. It's so the podcast. It was interesting. It was, it was really useful. It was um, definitely like a learning curve because I know we edited our podcast too. Then Georgia is a um, upper year MA student and had experience with podcasts. She like kind of cleaned it up for us, but we um, we edited them. And so, you know, we produced and designed and then edited. And, um, and yeah, it's now online, which is it's kind of cool. I should see how many people have, have listened to it. Um, but I think that was like really uh, practically helpful because like just recently at my job, like we have a podcast series and it's, it's slightly different, not fully history, but um, usually we hire people who like do everything, but now um, we're going to do, or I do like the basic production and basic editing and they clean it up. So like that's nice for me, nice saves us a bit of money too, but I wouldn't have acquired that skill set. I don't think I would have had the time to like invest in that skill set if I hadn't been able to do it in a class because it's just, you know, it takes a while to have that support um, to do that. Um, so like practically it's been like really useful. Um, so that's been a nice skill to like take away. And then interactions with the museum, yeah, they were, we interacted, you know, we, we visited them a couple times in person and then, um, Caitlin at the museum, you know, they were super responsive and, and helpful in terms of, I used a lot of oral histories in my podcast. We like emailed back and forth and they like pull the recordings for me. Um, 
I interviewed the, one of the directors of the museum, the director of the museum, and that was a bit in the podcast. So like, it was nice just to interact with them. And I always enjoy um, like sort of getting, it is nice to be part of like, kind of start to get, start to be part of like the public history community um, and wherever place you're living. Like, I just feel like that's grounding um, and just, obviously it's great for networking, but um, yeah, they were, it was cool. Nice to interact with them and um, they were super helpful, but yeah, big, one of the big takeaways too, is just like gaining this like practical skill of how to like design and vision a podcast, which I did edit, which I never done before. And then I guess the other takeaway too is like, you know, for my PhD, like my main field is Pacific Northwest history, but I'm hoping my secondary comp field will actually be public history, which has never, I don't think we've ever done that in the department before, but like my advisor is somewhat receptive and then um, he's receptive. And then, uh, you know, taking the class here makes me feel like there's probably like a way to do it since we, you know, we teach public history and everything. So hopefully, yeah. That sounds like it was a really good experience. Yeah. Cool. Um, briefly, maybe um, share um, some of the resources um, sort of that we, um, for anybody who's potentially interested. And then maybe we can see, um, I already got one question in the chat, so maybe we'll have a few more questions. Um, I'll get back to that in one second. There we go. Unmuting too. Fantastic. So, um, so Richard said like he spent a lot of time um, talking to, to um, like looking at different partners and figuring it all out. And so we compiled a little bit of um, a faculty sort of help page um, from the Arts Amplifier to sort of um, help with some of the sort of common questions and a little bit about the timeline. Um, and in case that like you also need some help to um, make this fit for your own course, um, we're happy if you want to reach out to us. Um, Richard mentioned he talked a lot to Letitia. She's our project lead. Um, we in general like have a lot of good relationships with a lot of community organizations and so it doesn't have to be history um, as long as it's sort of in the humanities um, we're very happy to sort of get involved we can either really help you find a partner um, we can also like give you some feedback um, on your on your syllabus um, or we can also provide you with some help on specific like assignments that you were thinking of or descriptions um, I'm also going to put these in the chat in a little bit. Um, I also wanted to point out that um, if you want to have a look specifically at um, the syllabus from Richard's class, you can have a look. I'll post that in the chat too. Um, we've collected a few more. Indeed, um, our pioneers in applied research projects um, do seem to be um, the history um, departments. And so we've collected another syllabus from somebody from UCLA and we're waiting for somebody else um, from another Canadian institution to share their syllabus with us. So it might give you a little bit of um, um, ideas of where you could take this. Um, we've sort of kept this very practical sort of in, in what could you get started and why would you maybe want to and, and what are some of the takeaways. But um, maybe if you have any questions um, more, more specifically or more broadly, um, feel free to share them either through the chat um, or you can um, just unmute yourself and um, ask your question. Yeah, Judy, go ahead. Yeah, it's hi, Richard. Um, so this is a, sorry, sorry, I joined late, so you may have already addressed this. Um, I wonder how do you evaluate the work of your students? I, I, I come with an undergraduate teaching background, so having a grade is very important. Um, and, and I'm also thinking about the challenge you have when you, if you ever need to negotiate a grade with the community partners, like um, just because the community partners may have very different expectations. I tried to find a way of, of um, creating projects that were substantial, but also to break it down so that it wasn't like one grade for the project at the very end, but rather that there be stages in which you can write drafts, you can get feedback, get feedback from uh, like the students were, two, two or three students worked on, um, on a research guide, which meant that two or three students had, let's say, a certain expertise, which they developed about photography. So that meant that when the student, one student did a uh, podcast and the other student did a, an exhibit, well, at least they knew about the subject of photography where they could talk to each other and give feedback. And then there were three students who worked on, three or four students who worked on exhibits, three and four who worked on podcasts. 
And so therefore they could have give feedback to each other about the process of doing podcasting. So it was very important for the projects to be broken down into smaller components, for there to be time for feedback, for drafts, for feedback, feedback from me, feedback from um, the community partner, and the community partner would share strengths and weaknesses. And that in fact, there would not be really, um, the grade wouldn't be given actually until there was time for the student to incorporate whatever feedback had been given. So ultimately the grading is gonna be on me, but it's only gonna be after a longer process of back and forth between students, between me and the students and between the community partner and the students. Um, and, um, and well, I mean, I, I, I spent a fair bit of time, I think, um, trying to, to crunch the numbers so that there was that kind of balance between sort of first drafts and final versions. Um, and uh, well, um, I, I, I hope it worked out and I hope it was fair. Maybe I can ask a follow-up question, sort of, of Lily, your, your, your focus on feedback just made me, uh, made me wonder, um, Lily, what was that process um, like for you? Like, was it sort of, it sounds a little bit like iterative development, like you get some input and then you work um, from there. How was it getting feedback from like all these different sources? Like you got feedback from, from Richard and you got feedback from your peers and from the museum itself. What was that yeah. like? It was good, yeah. It was Helpful to remember, yeah. Um, like we had sort of a feedback, we had a feedback day at the museums, so like our peers had to like read or listen to our first drafts by then, um, as well as the museum staff. So we got to sort of, I don't know if all of them managed to do it by then, but so we had this like everybody, we had got up, talked a little bit about what we did and then we could hear feedback, what people had like um, heard or listened. So it was, it was more fairly efficient that way to have it all and then follow up. Uh, written feedback, Dr. Menke. So um, that was helpful. And then that was like, and then I know then after the class ended too, there was a couple um, things that they spotted in the podcast, like very minor things. So we had like that round, um, but, you know, I found it helpful, like the peers, I remember them spotting some like interesting sort of communicative things um, with the podcast, like maybe getting things more clear. And then of course the staff, they, they're kind of like, uh, you know, they really spot the, um, like if you accidentally, like they, they, may, they can really do like quality control and making sure everything is accurate um, in the podcast. So just having those different stages, I think it's very similar to like what it would be like working with like a client. Um, if you were like working is like a uh, consulting historian or somebody like that. So well, anybody who has a question can have, feel free to use the chat or to raise your hand. Um, I have one more in the meantime, if anybody needs to gather their thoughts. Um, Judy made me think of um, sort of um, evaluation, like again, it happened sort of on, on both parts. And um, Richard, did you have any conversations with the museum afterwards, sort of about their experience? Like sort of Lily's comment about um, it working with a client made me sort of wonder, um, did you get any feedback from the museum side on how the project wrapped up sort of from their perspective? Yeah, I've uh, I've had a number of conversations with uh, with the director and with the people who were the immediate sort of uh, contact people, and and um, and they're very happy with the way that it went. I mean, that was, I mean, I think that one of the things that we have to do as instructors and in reaching out to them is to realize how, uh, of course, we're trying to you know, we're we're trying to provide a setting for the formation and for thinking about you know, how students can get other kinds of experiences. But in all fairness to the community partners, we need to think about, well, how might they benefit from this as well? I mean, they're going to benefit by having, I think, people who are, who, are, who are more in tune with the process of public history generally. But more specifically, I mean, these are things now that they are putting up on their website, right? These are things, you know, they have now three more research guides than they had before. They are having uh, another place where people visiting their website can go and learn about the topics and about the collection. So um, it was really important for me in advance to think about how this could benefit from, how they could benefit from it. And in my conversation with them since, they, they appreciate the work that the students have done 
and what they're able to put up on the website. Great. Yeah, I think you nicely touched upon the point that like this is always about mutual, mutual benefit like that. It's not um, that the organization is just sort of um, having to take care of like extra supervision, but that it's actually very talented and people who basically create work for them that they can actually um, use. Yeah, it's a great point. I don't want to be taking up all of our question and answer period. Does anybody else have a question? Maybe a, a, a form of engagement that you were thinking of that you'd like sort of some um, feedback on, as we just heard, can be very helpful. Yeah, I, I think that um, oh, there's a lot of people that, I mean, I have a list of people that I, sh I, I could be thanking people who, who were at the Holocaust Center, uh, the executive director, Nina Krieger, the collections registrar, Caitlin Donaldson, the archivist, Shyla Seller. Um, uh, I brought in an anthropologist who could give feedback on uh, the issue of you know, sort of curatorial dreaming where they can think about what they did in new ways. Um, I had the help of Letitia Henville. I had the help of, uh, of, of, of Danielle Barkley to talk about uh, professional development issues. Um, and I was able to get funding from my department so that um, I could hire somebody who's an experience, has experience with podcasting. Uh, that was Georgia Twist. Um, and then I also was able to get funding from the department so that we could visit, um, rather than just being us doing practical work, that we could visit other museums. Now, um, and I think, you know, that wasn't necessarily, they, they weren't, the students weren't at this point creating their own, but they were seeing other places which had faced these issues. So we went uh, to the sports, uh, the BC Sports Museum and the First Nations Gallery and spoke to the, um, to the um, uh, executive director there, Jason Beck. And we also were able to speak to Chief Laura Mussel Savage of the uh, Squaw First Nation in Chilliwack to talk about the, um, the gallery that they'd created. We did a virtual visit to the Museum for Human Rights, and we also listened to a number of podcasts. So um, there are people I wanted to thank, but I also wanted to highlight that the practical work isn't always just doing the work, but also seeing other places which have done this work. And you need to, that's one of the things that you need to build in, which maybe I hadn't stressed before, visiting, uh, visiting other museums and speaking to other uh, museums before you're doing your own project can be part of that process. And, um, and once you think about ways of building that in too, um, I would recommend that people try to avoid doing this in the middle of a pandemic and, and trying to figure out whether we're gonna make it into a museum or not. And in fact, for two museums, we were the first group in there after the pandemic. But, um, but if you're free from that kind of concern or restraint, yeah, you should try to think about how you can bring in others beyond your partner, not necessarily to be doing the hands-on work, but to share their experience of doing hand, of doing um, practical work. That actually sounds like it was an amazing class. Lily, I, I really hope that your PhD experience can live up to <laughs> the finish of your master's degree. <laughs> yeah, I really, I will say the, the Indigenous Sports Gallery, like, that was such a highlight. I know like all my classmates who were just so pleased with that visit in that, in that gallery, like I also just recommend like, it's like kind of tucked away museum. So it's like this amazing gallery. So if you ever are like downtown near it, like yeah, I really recommend that one. Perfect. Yeah, I have to admit, I haven't explored many museums. I'm sort of, I'm also like, I'm, I'm fairly new by now. I think I'm a year in Vancouver, but half of their things were still pretty much closed down. And, <laughs> um, and so uh, um, I'll have a growing list basically of places to go and visit. So we're sort of um, finishing time-wise, but if anybody else wants to have a question answered, um, we can squeeze another one in. Yeah, I don't have I don't have a question, but I, I, um, Rich's comment really reminds me of an experience. I was in a, I I was I was joining a end of the course sharing where there's students working in the community, and 
it's an animal welfare program. So we also had community partner coming to Monsoon, um, coming to join. And it was really interesting. It was quite exciting at the end that um, the North Vancouver Coyote Group um, is now hearing how the Richmond Group, um, how how they develop, like how, how the partners are actually learning from each other and then sharing information and finding out, oh, the students help you do this? We would like something like this too. So it was, I, I, this reminds me that it was a Zoom meeting. So, but then I remember that conversation that the partners are started, they are taking over the conversation because they really want to know what each other is doing in that different area. So, so that that was a highlight for me when I was in that um, sharing at the end of a course. I mean, I I do want to say that uh, one of the questions that you asked me in advance was, you know, what is the what is it that I hope the students would gain? Uh, but I want to flip that question. I want to emphasize for everybody who's out there that. There's so much the instructors gain from doing this kind of work. Um, in my case, um, you know, I felt that together we were exploring questions of authority and sharing authority and what it means. And I learned an enormous amount from the students. I was moved by how respectful the students were of the stories and the images that they were consulting at the at the Holocaust Center. And um, yeah, it was it was it it it, it really may deepen my own understanding and feeling about that kind of issue, that issue of sharing authority. So it was a wonder, ex wonderful experience working with the students and more specifically doing the applied research uh, was not just a great benefit to them, but to me. Now, again, there's going to be, I hope, very practical things like that they've gotten hands-on experience, that they can add it to their resume, that they can get a letter from me saying that they've done it. They can get a letter from somebody as, from a shared partner so there's really, you know, very hands-on practical things, but there's also a very strong, uh, uh, a strong benefit intellectually and professionally and even emotionally from working on a project like this. That might actually be the, the perfect way to finish a session for like um, instruction and teaching and learning um, uh, at the university. I think it's very nicely indeed highlighting um, that um, the work put in is definitely worth it for um, all basically participants. Um, so yeah, thank you all so much um, for your time. And like um, Richard and Lily um, had to get like questions from me and everything and take the time to, to think about it. And both are taking their time out of their, um, their research days um, to be here. So thank you both very, very much for your time and your, your insight and perspective. And um, I put all of our resources in the chat if anybody wants to most of the things um, will be found on our faculty help page. And uh, yeah, if any of you have any questions, feel free to reach out to the Arts Amplifier again.